This episode is proudly sponsored by The Helix, a new innovation district located in New Brunswick, New Jersey, the heart of the Northeast Corridor. The Helix provides a critical ecosystem for innovation by offering a range of physical environments, a vibrant community of leading innovators, and a strategic central location on the Northeast Corridor. The Helix will uniquely mix workspaces, classrooms, laboratories, venues, and collaborative environments creating a dynamic community and setting for innovative minds. Universities, startups, Fortune 500 companies, entrepreneurs, researchers, and many others will all call the Helix home. Thus far, the Helix has assembled a community of innovative private and public organizations, such as Rutgers Health, the New Jersey Innovation Hub, RWJ Barnabas Health, Hackensack Meridian Health, universities from Ireland and Israel, and others. The Helix is where ideas will come to life. To learn more, visit helixnj.com. From NJ.com and the Star Ledger, welcome to the Rutgers Rant, your one-stop podcast for the Scarlet Knights, with your hosts, Steve Politi and Rutgers insiders Brian Fonseca and Pat Lenny. Let's start shopping. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Rutgers Rant. Politi here, Lenny and Fonseca taking a break from the eight minutes they're allowed to watch spring football practice to record this podcast thanks fellows how's it how's the weather out there how's it looking down down at Piscataway very sunny I will say that I got my yeah. shades up for a reason in the press I, which is I like see that a nerd move but are you allowed to are you, do you have to clear that with Greg Shanna before you tell me it's sunny is that the kind of thing <laughs> does he want like an official characterization that it's actually partly sunny or perhaps uh breezy or something like that is that is that You've got that cleared. I don't know that Grant controls the weather, so. Well, that's true. So you can get it beforehand. Don't actually have to. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) We kid. It's football season, sort of football season. All right, let's start with football. We might as well. You guys had a scrimmage. I don't know what you can tell me. What you can't tell me. I do know this. Everything I've heard is that this is a rare thing in Rutgers football uh, lately. (laughs) By lately, I mean the last 10 years where I can say the words, it looks like the offense was ahead of the defense. I really thought that. It was kind of shocking. Uh, I didn't walk in expecting that, but I will say the offense certainly played really well. But you have to put a little caveat on that because a lot of the defense, the first team defenders did not play or did not play a lot. So a lot of the best defensive players were not out there. But the first team offense, a lot of the starters were out there. So it was the best offensive players going against a lot of, you know, some some backups and guys looking for starting roles. So you gotta you gotta take that with a grain of salt a little even bit. Even so. But yes, you can even alter, so. <laughs> even so, you can utter the phrase that you know the offense did did surprisingly look pretty good. All right. So let's start with the quarterbacks because that's what people care about the most. Who's got the job, Pat? Who's got the job? I know you don't can't answer that. Uh, who uh, look good? I, they both I, look good. I, I said they both looked very. Gavin Wimsett and Ethan Kaliagmanis looked very. I, I think this is going to be a really. If you're looking at this quarterback competition, it's going to go. It the set. There's no separation at least now. Uh, it's going to to me. I think they're very similar players. They have very similar skill sets, processing all that. So I I, I think this is going to come down to the wire. And I, if I'm making a guess here in April. I, I would say this plays out all the way to the first game. So I, I, I don't know, but I thought they both looked pretty good. Uh, with that said, the the reps were split evenly between those two. Uh, they both had some great throws. They both had some not so great throws. They both showed some ability with their legs. I, I think when you see them in the spring game, you're you're going to get the same evaluation. So, but I, I will say I will add this. I thought Winsett played one of the better uh, played better than last year was a little bit more accurate and uh you looked a little bit improved i guess brian this is what i would say it's like it's you know we've we've heard that so oh, he, you should see that kid in practice you should see him in practice we've heard that a lot from gavin i mean not not to take it away obviously he's still you know he's is he, is he 19 yet i mean he's still a young quarterback he's still developing we get all that uh you would think he would take a big step up I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm guess I'm I, I'm I'm going to reserve uh, any sort of practice observations until I until I see it for real for him. Gavin Wimson has Jason Tatum disease, where he's 19 until he's 27 years old. That's the, how old is, is that he? What we're back? Gavin Wimson, 
I'm, yeah. I'm fairly certain he's 20, at least maybe 21. No, he's not 21. Really? Man, I'm getting old. I'm going to Google well, look it up. You, you talk, look you it talk. Up. Okay. Well, just to be clear, I was not at the scrimmage on Saturday. I was in Portland all week last week for the Nike Hoop Summit to uh, watch Dylan Harper and Ace Bailey. We'll talk about that later. But um, I think the general rule that I'm following is that nothing you see in practice is something you should take a big picture look at, especially mm-hmm. not the first scrimmage. I think you should kind of take these things as they are. You should look at it as a big picture thing. After seeing multiple practices, after seeing multiple scrimmages, uh, we know we're not watching any of practice. Uh, we'll be watching the scrimmages. You'll see the spring game. I would say treat every spring scrimmage like you would the spring game. It's a good window, but it's not the end-all, be-all. And I think we'll know a lot more in training camp. But I think it's definitely encouraging to hear that he's doing better. Uh, it means he didn't regress. It means he's taking steps in the right direction. And I think you would expect him to be more comfortable in Kirk Scirocco's offense the second time around. And, you know, get a little bit of kick in the butt. Having a guy right behind him that's competing for right. the job certainly helps too. It's a great sign if, if that's the case that he is taken by all everything you've read, everything they've said uh, that they're approaching this, that the competition makes them better. Uh, and it's good to see that that's what he's doing in execution. Competition is something we haven't had a receiver in a long time. And it looked like, Pat, there were uh, there's some depth at that, some interesting people in depth at that position. It's really interesting when you look at the depth chart. And that was what also one of my biggest takeaways that I thought the receivers were a lot better than they were a season ago, uh, because you have a lot of veteran guys at the top of the depth chart and then some younger guys trying to trying to carve out playing time. Uh, what Greg said on Saturday, I thought it was very true. You got Dimeer Miller transfer from Monmouth coming in, should be a should be a big time player. Nassim Brantley eligible now after sitting out last year, who was expected to be a big time player last year. And even uh, Chris Long, who was injured last season coming back. So he's viewing it as they have three kind of new receivers at the top of the depth chart. And that doesn't even you know count for guys like Christian Dremel, who was the team's leading receiver last year. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then uh, if you watch the scrimmage on Saturday, one of the big takeaways was the freshman receivers were ha- had really good games. So um, Ben Black was one of them. Uh, KJ Duff was a four-star recruit. He had a great game. So it's it's a very interesting room with a lot of candidates. And I'm really intrigued to see if the receivers are better than they were last season. Because I, I think right now that's the way it's trending. There's some speed there in the freshman receivers, if if I'm reading this correctly. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think uh that's that's a and and KJ Duff is also one of those guys that has, is a really big receiver. Uh, can go up and get the ball. I think Rutgers hasn't had one of those six four, six five type receivers in a couple of years. You know, Fama Ture is, is kind of one of those two. Uh, DeAndre Johnson is in his second season. He's six seven, uh, so I think they have good size, good speed, and and experienced guys at the top, which is the most important thing. All right, Greg Shano said that he he thinks the offensive line they know the five guys there already, which is interesting to say that on you know, April 15th um, tax day. We're saying we know the guys, uh, but uh, tight end, it's still listening. That is very much up in the air. First of all, on the offensive line, I was, I was shocked that they come, that Greg Shannon said that. Yeah. They've come to the, not, not that everything's set in stone. He had obviously put an asterisk on it saying there's going to be competition every day. But as of now, he thinks that he has the five guys identified that would be the five starters on opening day, which I, which was crazy to hear kind of took me back a little bit. And yes, tight end. I think that there are three veterans in the room, Kenny Fletcher, Mike Higgins, and uh, Victor Kanoka. Those mm-hmm. guys, uh, they've been in the program. They've, they've learned the position. Uh, they've gone through off seasons with a Wade program. And and I think they're just looking for one of those guys to really take hold of the position. And I, I think you'll see that in the spring game as well. Uh, the one bit of news, Renee Conga entering the, the transfer board, Brian, I guess what's interesting about that, it, it's that the fact that I was surprised is I think a good sign for the football program because everyone entered I and mean, everyone's in the transfer portal. So the fact that they actually lost the guy like, Oh, wait, what, what, why? You know, I was, that was my first reaction. And I remembered, Oh yeah, it's, it's 2024. You know, half of college football is going to be in the transfer portal. Uh, I, I mean, he's a depth player. I think he's a guy who certainly would have played. What, what, what's your theory on what happened there? So first of all, I looked up his birthday. Gavin Wimsit is 20 years old. He turns 21 in late October. He'll so he's not 19. 19 to me. Okay, he's not. He's 20. Gotcha. All right. Yes. Thanks for uh, Ray Conga. Clarification. Is, yeah, you're welcome. 
I think he's the first impact guy they've lost this offseason, which, again, to your point, is very encouraging about where Rutgers football is at. I think he was in a spot where he wasn't going to get starting snaps, obviously, because he's behind Aaron Lewis and Wesley Bailey, veteran guys who decided to come back, proven guys. Uh, he was probably going to be uh, the first or second guy you know, off the bench into the rotation, depending on the situation in the game. Um, and it sounds like he just wanted to find a spot where he can play more snaps, right? Have a bigger role, which it's hard to fault a guy for doing that. But um, one, I wonder at what level he'll be able to do that, right? Uh, right. Rutgers has a good defensive line, but it's not like there are many other Big Ten teams that have open defensive end spots that he can just slide into. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess that's just kind of what he had to decide. Will, will he want to play a bigger role at probably a smaller school or be part of the rotation this season and kind of plant his flag for next year when Aaron Lewis and Wesley Bailey, I believe they don't have any more eligibility, but even if they do, they're probably both NFL bound. Rutgers was probably lucky to keep them for one more year anyway. Uh, then he could have kind of slid and been the bona fide starter from there. Uh, obviously, he decided to go with the first option. Um, and I wonder what strategy Rutgers will go with. Will they get another guy in the portal to fill that in, or do they have younger guys uh, behind him that can kind of rise up? Uh, will be interesting. I don't know if there's a clear answer from where I sit right now. Yeah, it was. I mean, I, seeing, I guess, his offers, when you look at it, the Yukons, the Cincinnati is a good program, obviously. Um, but still, yeah, it's, it's, I was a little surprised by that because I, you just figure a guy who's going to play, even if it's, you know, fifth, if it's half the snaps, like that, like you would think that that's enough that you'd get noticed for the NFL. But that's his decision. That's 2024. Uh, any other news? We know we, we don't know who the punter is. We're not going to get stop worrying about the punter. No, the we're just not going to. Um, Manunga and Robert Longer being, we should probably bring up. Right. Uh, you told me those weren't serious, so I decided not to panic about that. Well, they're not going to be playing in the spring game, so I think it's good for people to know right. that. They shouldn't have been playing in the spring game up anyway. I'm going to get 30 carries in the spring game. Yeah, so. That's right. They should, he should be. They should do the Saquon Barkley treatment with him and not let him near the field until August 29th. But okay, right. So, yeah, I, I Obviously, you won't see them in the spring game, uh, but they were minor injuries, and they're expected to be back full strength for summer workouts, which is even before training camps. So that's more like July. All right. So put on your, put on your Shianoologist hats here. Um, you've been around him. There's a lot of optimism outside the program, I guess, I, I, you know, the more, the, 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 the closer we get, the more that time passes, the more I see the rest of the big 10, the more I see developments in news, you know, it, get, it seems like it's growing, you know, from that standpoint, what do you get? What, what's your sense from him? Is Greg is is Greg smiling more than usual? You've been around him a little bit now. Do you think he's optimistic? Yeah, I, I'll say this. This is year three for me. And I thought this was uh, after the scrimmage on Saturday, I was telling people, I thought this was one of the most optimistic, jovial, uh, you know, making jokes. I, I thought was, he was very happy after the scrimmage. And I thought it was because they played well. Yeah, I tell people that. Uh, right. I, I think there is a lot of optimism for this team. They've got ex a lot of experience back. They've got the competition at quarterback, which should help everyone improve. They've got the Big Ten's leading rusher back. I think there's a very – the floor is very – it's set. The foundation's set. I think they're looking at that, and they've improved the roster. They, like I said, they've got good depth. So I think uh, – and, and certainly everyone's got to talk about the schedule. I think from an outside perspective, there is a you know expectation that this team should be better than they were even last year, and that's a, obviously a big step forward. Normal spring game? I'm not going to do anything like like crazy like Ole Miss, or we're not going to throw wrinkles out there from what we understand. I think it's the same as always. Farley versus White, they'll split the players up. You know, have one assistant coach one team. It kind of like a they do a little bit of a draft, right? Uh, so it's it's fun. And uh, no, uh, Ohio State on Saturday had like the defense got points for a three and an out. Yeah, I don't yeah, like that stuff. Yeah, that. No, 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 it's a real scrimmage. Yeah, good, good, traditional. We like traditional things here in New Jersey. Uh, all right. Anything else on football? Can we move to hoops? Uh, Michigan and Ohio State's spring game was on Fox. Do you think Rutgers will ever be at a point where their spring game is going to be on broadcast national network TV? Oh, uh -huh. That's Ohio wild. State. Really? What was it up against? Good grief. Up against oh, okay. the Masters? Yeah, it was, I yeah, like no. to see the ratings there. You know golf's in trouble if uh, the Michigan spring game beats the final or the second round, third round of the Masters. That'd be, there that'd was be also great. like wow. 70,000. Oh, at Ohio State spring game, which was insanity too. They, yeah, they're they had a sellout at the spring game, which or not a sellout, but the stadium was completely filled, which is incredible. Wild. Yeah. 
there stuff. were a couple of moments this weekend where you like moments like that where you notice kind of the levels there are in college athletics. Seventy thousand people watching an Ohio State spring game. Twenty two thousand people in person for a Mark Pope press conference at Kentucky. There were five thousand people who were not let into the building because it was so filled for a press conference of a coach that. Three days before, people were ready to jump off a balcony because it wasn't, you know, Scott Drew or Dan Hurley. 22,000 people for a press conference for basketball. It, it is a different world in some places compared to. That's pretty amazing. Um, Can you imagine you get the microphone and you fumble that question? There's some pressure there when you got that all of a sudden. And they brought, they brought people in like when Pike, Pike was hired. I mean, it was like some performance art there for some of these press conferences. Not 20,000 people. That That's a little bit. It's a bit, it's a bit much. Yeah. It's it's BBN is different and people like to joke around about how these fan bases have nothing else to do in Kentucky and all this stuff, but they show up, man. Nebraska people, yeah. they show up and it makes a difference. It's why when you look at, I guess we can look at the next topic of the transfer portal and stuff. It's why these fan bases have enormous resources given to these schools to work with in the transfer portal. Kentucky, as soon as they hired Mark Pope, announced they have $4 million in NIL to work with for players in his first season. Um, it's because of the enormity of these fan bases. How much of that money is going to be spent on Cliff Omori? Well, if he decides <laughs> to go to Rutgers, uh, sorry, if he decides to go to Kentucky, I'd imagine a decent amount of it. Though that's interesting you bring that up because the figures, again, with this stuff is impossible to suss out because mm-hmm. you hear from some people a million dollars. I heard from someone this weekend who I think would probably know. It's like not directly connected, but would have an idea. You know, you hear like 400 to 500,000, which is half, obviously, still a lot of money. So it's impossible to know what these guys are getting. But to answer your question, I could totally see Cliff in Kentucky. I could totally see Cliff in a lot of places. He's a pretty popular pod. He's playing it pretty pretty savvily. He's he's waiting it out. No need to jump any place quickly. But Rutgers had some news. Obviously, we were expecting. I don't think we we had the Martini news when the we did our last podcast. It's been a little while now. Um, so that's fans have had a chance to process that. I guess the question is, we haven't had any other um, significant news since then, Brian. Uh, I mean, I get the, the portal is going to open up again and fans shouldn't panic, but I think there's a little bit of uh, apprehension that, that that might be it. What, what's the story here? So that's not going to be it. They're going to fill all these two more scholarships. They need to get a center. They need to get another sharpshooter, uh, ideally a 3 and D wing. Um, they're going to get bodies, right? I don't think there's any concern about that. Um, to your point, since the last time we spoke, spoken, there was an entire dead period, a week-long dead period, where they couldn't host any – visitors so i think that contributed to the kind of slowing things down uh, i think we talked about martini a decent amount last time but just to kind of put a bow on it great addition i think pretty much a perfect addition for a spot they needed a veteran guy who would shoot the ball tough as nails has experience has played in the ncaa tournament knows what it takes to win is very eager to mentor the younger players in the program and loves ruckers huge ruckers football fan uh growing up in in somerset county he got in uh, for his official visit at Rutgers. They brought him to a practice, as Pat reported last week. He t- sat in Greg Shiano's office for 25 minutes and to a point where uh, Kevin McConnell, who was the father of an assistant coach at Princeton, Brent McConnell, has to knock on the door and say, Coach, you got to come out. You're going to be late to practice, which is just, I think, classic Shiano sales. For, I, mean, I, know for, I don't know for a fact. I am very confident that Greg Shiano knew exactly what time it was and what time practice started and that he wasn't going to be late for practice for a basketball recruit, but it is a nice touch. Um, so I think... Martini fits all all the characteristics you need. Um, Rutgers had a visitor this weekend. Our Adams Gorey reported it. Jordan Durkak, uh, the Merrimack star, Colonia native, Northeast Conference Player of the Year and Defensive Player of the Year. Rutgers is high on him. I know Rutgers likes him a lot as a player. I think they they believe there is room for him to grow because the biggest red flag, and I know you're already shaking your head, Steve, is that of course I'm sitting here. Yes. Right. His three you know what I'm going to bring up? 27%. Yes. 20, 27% from three. Now, 27%. Here's another, here's another, here are the points the one that they need, Brian. I'm sorry. No, I, I'll stop the joke. No, you are, you are you're saying exactly what every Rutgers fan is going to say. One thing. Uh, whenever Shooting. His name comes up. The yes. literal one thing. Okay. So here's two, two counterpoints. Two counterpoints. 27%. And this might sound like <laughs> it, it's making it worse, but here's a counterpoint. He shot 22% as a freshman. That's a 5% well, improved bump. by 5%. Yeah. That's what they'll point to. And the fact that at the NEC, he took 30% of his team shots had the highest usage rate of the entire conference. <laughs> he was the, he was guarded as the number one guy at Rutgers. He would not be the number one guy. Maybe having that space, having better teammates, 
better situation to shoot will also improve his three-point percentage. And there are the other things that they like about him. He's a good defender. He's tall and long and has the body to be a good defender, which obviously is a requirement to play for Steve Peichel. He is a good guy getting to the rim and getting fouled. He draws a ton of fouls, draws a ton of free throws, and shoots 70% from the free throw line. So there's that. Uh, there are the intangibles. He's a tough kid, all that good stuff that uh, you can't really prove with stats, but uh, I'll, I'll defer uh, to people that watch him. That's the, my understanding that he's a tough kid and does all the little things, whatever. Uh, so that's kind of the pitch on him. I don't know if he'll end up at Rutgers. I think Penn, he went to Penn State and Seen Hall as well. Uh, they might be better fits in so far as they have starter minutes for him at guard. And if he wants to be a starter after being the star player on a smaller team, those two spots are probably better. Uh, if he wants to come home and be kind of a role guy on a team with really talented players, I think Rutgers would fit. Who knows? Uh, my understanding after talking to Adam this morning is that Jordan is preying on his decision, thinking about it. Maybe we'll know more in the, in the next couple of days, but it sounds like Rutgers is in it, and it sounds like Rutgers is high on him. So I wouldn't be surprised if he landed at Rutgers, but I don't think by any stretch of the imagination is it a lock at this point. Do we have any idea who they're targeting for the for the post position? I'm gonna I'm gonna assume that they've worked it out in their head that they can find someone to between Martini and between the freshmen. I'm not like I'm not discounting the fact that you're bringing in two talented players who might be the answer to to the three point shots outside percent, of course. But have they identified who the who the point? They do not have the post player that I've seen at this point. Have they identified? Do you have any idea who they're looking at there? I don't have any names. I don't know that. I think that's the one area that everyone is dying to find out. I've, we've discussed Amari Williams. Obviously, he's way out of their price range. He's, you know, every time there's an update on Amari Williams, there's a better team. Soon enough, the, the Detroit Pistons are going to try to sign him. Uh, that's the way the portal works these days. Um, but they're going to try to find a center that's the priority. An interesting name that popped in the portal yesterday, his name is Andrew Carr, uh, played at Way Forest. So Rutgers got a good look at him last year. Uh, six foot ten, power forward, who could probably play a little bit of center. Good block rate, can shoot the three, can score around the rim, which I want to use this as an opportunity that every time a name like that pops up in the portal and people get really excited about the thought of him coming to Rutgers, realize that every other fan base that needs a center is feeling the same exact way. And all the teams that are going after Cliff Omori, he can't go to all of them, right? So when Cliff Omori decides to go to, let's say, Kentucky, right, the team that came up second to him, they also need a center. So maybe they'll get, let's say, Amari Williams. And then once they get Amari Williams, the next guy in the pecking order will say, maybe let's get Andrew Carr. My point being that Rutgers is not at a level to compete for the top-end kids. And I don't know if Andrew Carr necessarily is a top-end kid, but I think anytime a name comes up, people need to think about that. How big of a recruit is this kid? Who are, who is Rutgers competing against, and is it realistic? Another kid that went in the portal, his name, uh, Kobe from Washington Heights, New York, shot 50% on threes last year. 50% on 200 threes. He'd be great for Rutgers. He'd be a perfect mm -hmm. fit. You know where else he'd be a perfect fit? The rest of college basketball, okay? I could see him at a, you know, a place like UConn or Kansas, or anywhere else that needs a 50% three-point shooter on volume. So I'm just saying, when it comes to names, I'm, I, I don't have any. I'm trying, and we're talking about timeline as well. Like, it's taking long. It's The portal closes May 1st, but that doesn't mean guys can't commit after May 1st. Um, I, would, I would caution patience, and I would caution trying to be a little bit more realistic on guys workers can realistically get target and land. So Fair enough. All right. Pat, I'm sure you've noticed that your colleague is – taking uh, the whole freshman class to uh, add to it, to cross off states on his travel list. Like this has been, this has been quite the boondoggle. Like who would have imagined that we would be traveling across the country for uh, exhibition basketball, high school basketball games. Hey, with Portland, Maine. You see this, Pat? He was in Portland, Maine. Oh, Portland, Oregon. You were in Oregon? Wait, that Oregon. game was in Oregon? Oregon. Was that really in Oregon? Nike. <laughs> Nike. It's got to be Oregon. <laughs> Can we get confirmation class? You flew, you flew to Oregon? You thought I was in Portland, Maine? I did. I don't know why. I thought I, I can't. I, this is even more amazing. I just saw Portland. I don't think the guy looked at the, the after. I thought you were in Maine. That's very funny. You were in Oregon. Wow. You thought Nike's headquarters were in Portland, well, I didn't. Maine? Look, all right. So, look, I was, I, was in, I was in Puerto Rico. I wasn't really paying attention. I just saw Portland. I you tweeted. You were, you were in Portland, Puerto Rico? I went to Puerto Rico for a couple of days. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I know that. Yeah. So I wasn't really paying close attention. I'm faking it. You yeah, were in Portland, tan. Oregon. I, I see the bloody tan. It's looking good. Pretty good. Got sunburn. My kids were making fun of me. <laughs> After telling them to put on the sunburn, sun lotion, I got I got scorched. That's okay. I can uh, I throw, while we're on the topic of vacation, can I throw a uh, crazy uh, basketball name at you guys? Yep. Go ahead. 
Jersey native DJ Wagner is in the portal. No, oh, there you go. That's perfect. Come home, come home, DJ. Come on, man. He's not going pro. I think he's following Coach Cal to Arkansas and getting some of that sweet, sweet Tyson Walmart money. Tyson Walmart, oh, man. Coach Cal's not dumb. But that move makes sense for that reason and that reason alone. Uh, all right, so Oregon apparently. Tell me about the the hell's about that trip. Yeah, it's far. Uh, it was a lot of days. I missed home. Yeah. I, I never missed New Jersey more than when I was in Oregon for four days. I'll tell you. How, uh, how long were you there? Four days? I, four days, yes. Um, well, the, the, the event was four days. I was there five for six because I had to fly in and fly out. Oh, um, yeah. I, had, I had an 11 p.m. flight out of Portland on Sunday night. So I had to spend all of Sunday at the Portland airport. Um, and I didn't get home till 7 a.m. Monday. A whole yeah. other discussion. I don't want to be, you know, bitching about my travels here, but it was a lot. Portland, as far as the games itself, the practices, um, a lot of the same things as we've been saying for um, months now with Ace Bailey and Dylan Harper. They looked apart. They looked like they belonged on the floor against some of the other best top prospects of their age. Um, they played against some really good competition on the world team, um, and they held their own. Uh, Dylan Harper, again, impressive at getting to the rim. I am increasingly impressed by his defense, or at the very least his defensive motor every time I watch him. Against the world team, they have this kid named A.J. DeBonsa, who's arguably the best team player in high school basketball right now. He's a junior at Prolific Prep. And he was asking the coach for the assignment. He was pointing at the kid. He wanted to guard him. Um, and DeBonsa, I asked him after the game, and he had a good quote. He's like, essentially, like, dogs want to guard dogs. Like, big players want to guard big players. And that obviously uh, made an impression. Uh, Ace Bailey, uh, again, the, the, the flickers are there, right? Like, he had a tremendous scrimmage on Thursday. He was the best player on the floor. He looked just awesome. And then he had a bit of an up and down game on Saturday at the Hoop Summit. But he, again, his moments of brilliance are really, really good. He's still knocking down deep threes, creating his own shot. Um, I've noticed the last couple of times I've watched him, he's making smart cuts to the basket um, and just kind of making some high basketball IQ moves, which I'm, I'm becoming more increasingly impressed with. So, And you, you see them around a lot of NBA scouts. Brad Stevens was there. The Bucks sent uh, one of the high-end guys in their in their front office there. A scout from every team was there, and every guy I talked to, impressed with those two guys. Uh, everyone's talking about kind of pitching their bosses to make sure they make a trip to the rack next year. Everyone's going to want to be there. So much of the same, I guess, is what I would say about the trip. And they have one more all-star event this Saturday, the Jordan Brand Classic <laughs> in Brooklyn. Is, is that one in Portland, Maine, by any chance? No. Sorry. That one is in Brooklyn, New York, not Brooklyn uh, insert state. That's that I too bad. Here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just got to take a short drive over the Brooklyn Bridge. And after that, they will probably take a break, hopefully, because they've been playing basketball every day for the past 17 years. And they will enroll at Rutgers late May and start practices. June 15th is the first practice. So um, that's where they stand now. I don't know if Ace will compete in the Jordan Brand Classic. I know he was invited. He's no longer listed on the roster. And my understanding is he will be at prom for McEachern, which is the Friday before the event on Saturday. That can change, obviously, but that's my understanding at the current moment. So Saturday might – the Jordan Brand Classic might be a Dylan Harper-only uh, event for Rutgers. Experience the Heldridge Hotel, a luxury hotel that's perfect for both the business and leisure traveler. Ideally located within minutes of Rutgers University, the Heldridge is convenient to all the action and activities at SHI Stadium, Jersey Mike's Arena, and the Rutgers University campus. The moment you walk through the doors of the Heldridge Hotel and Conference Center, you know you're someplace different. A place with an independent spirit and a boutique vibe. A place where you can immerse yourself in your meeting or event as easily as you can the local culture. Located in the heart of the city, the Heldridge lets you experience all that New Brunswick has to offer. Whether you're coming to New Brunswick for a fun weekend with friends, in town for a Scarlet Nights game, or attending a business meeting, book your accommodations today at theheldridge.com. Wow. Good, to, good, a good little reminder that they're still in high school and they have to go to prom as opposed to going to an all star game. Um, all right, so you, I mean, you're around NBA scouts. Is, is there a sense that they are the two of the three top guy? Obviously, yes. All you wrote, you wrote about Cooper Flag too, who uh, was fantastic by your account. Uh, is it is it clear that they are the two uh, two of the top three or four guys? I would say so. Uh, mm. In their class, it's hard to tell. I thought VJ. Uh, VJ Edgecombe, who is going to Baylor, another five-star guard. He played for the World Team. I thought he was really, really good, too. I think it's clear that they're one of the top five guys, right? I think where they rank is kind of 
a matter of where how they fit at the college level and all that stuff. I thought Cooper Flag was tremendous, the best I've seen him play. Uh, I've watched him play a few times. That was the best performance I saw from him. But yeah, I, th- I think they belong on the floor. They're, every time I've seen them play in these games, they've been one of the be- better players on the floor, at least one of them, sometimes both of them. Um, and, but when it gets to the college level, the thing I'm really interested to see is, one, the players that are around him, as we discussed ad nauseum, and two, how they are kind of coached because these All-Star games have a lot of talent, but you know the most they had to practice is three days before the event. Um, there's not a lot of coaching going on, not a lot of plays being set. Opposing coaches don't have you know three days to scout film on them and get their tendencies, and um, so I think Rutgers coaches are going to have to have a, do a really good job of maximizing those talents and adding a lot of talent around them. All right, good job. By the way, I'm going to Portland in August, but the the real Portland. Just to be clear, that's where vacation is after I get back from the Olympics. So just going to add that whole circle on that. All right, can we take some questions from our uh, from our friends from our Rutgers insiders? We don't have a lot. I think people. Have have got most of, either they've tuned us out or they've got most of the answers to their questions. We don't have that many this week. Um, Peter and Palm City had a good one though. Next to last sack total in the league last year. Same guys returned. Is that a good thing? And the young players with sack potential. Pat, what is the pass rush situation for the Scarlet Knights? It's a really great observation and and note there because you're right. The the sack numbers were way down, and but the the pressure rate which is kind of a key stat if you go to pro football focus, was about where it should be. Uh, guys like Aaron Lewis were getting to the quarterback. They just weren't finishing the plays. That That's a whole other story. Um, but I think, you know, Mo, Mo Ture had a year at linebacker. I think that's going to help. Uh, Aaron Lewis has talked about he, he wasn't – he wasn't happy with how he finished last season. And he's, he's back for another year to really improve. And, and Wesley Bailey, you know, he's another defensive end that – maybe had a little bit of a down year. So I think they're very motivated. Obviously they have NFL aspirations and they need kind of a big year. And Shiano himself came out and said he challenged the defensive line. And uh, when we, when we talked to him one day and he's just, we did not live up to our potential last year, we need to create more pressure with, with three and four guys. So I think there's a huge emphasis on getting to the quarterback and, and, and bringing down the quarterback more on that in terms of, of new faces to look for on the defensive line. I think it's more, you already know the names. One guy to circle is defensive tackle Malcolm Ray. He's a transfer from Florida State. Uh, right. he, he's going to be like a, a plug-in, probably starter at defensive tackle. But in terms of rushing, rushing the passer, it's going to be the same guys, and they just need to have a better season, I think. All right. All right. And along those lines, Rocco wanted to know, first, Shannon said that we need more size and depth in the team. I'm worried about our size. I don't see the size in this team to match USC and the other heavy hitters. Uh, do you agree that we need to add a lot more size on both lines? Um, I mean, this has sort of been the Chiano thing for, you could say, four years, or you can say 24 years. I mean, he, he, built, he built the lines the first time around, built, built them on speed uh, at a time where you weren't playing a lot of big teams like they are now. But still, I mean, there was, you know, that was the, that was always the premium. He wanted guys who could get to the quarterback more than he wanted. 400 pound dudes um but so do you do you agree with what Rocco said and do they need more size every team needs more size but there are only so many six foot nine 270 pound defensive ends or defensive tackles or offensive ta- tackles what have you and those guys are all going to the premier schools that recruit the best right like that's just kind of all this comes down to doing better recruiting because you can get you know unathletic six foot seven guys if you want but the premier talents obviously are at a premium um so do they need more big guys? Yes. So does every other team in college football. Uh, it's it's an astute observation, but that's going to come down to recruiting better. And um, I would say they're doing pretty well in recruiting, but that's obviously taking the next step in recruiting. And to do that, you probably have to take the next step this season. Um, it's kind of all a snowball effect. But I think the Broncos on the right path. All right, a couple of basketball questions. This is this is a good one that we got uh, right after the podcast last week. Uh, did Rutgers make a mistake by not giving Danny Hurley the contract he wanted when it hired Steve Michael? It's a great kind of one. And it's just funny because I was thinking about this. Like, obviously, Danny Hurley's the son in college. I mean, he is the bright, shining. I mean, he's taken over college basketball, second national championship, has built that program in such a way he's got a chance to win you know, it's just keep on going uh, the way he's done it. Rutgers had a chance to hire him, went after him. Pat Hobbs went after him when 
Um, they hired when they were when they hired Steve Pico and replaced Eddie Jordan. It was one of the first time they went after him. Went after him hard. It was a, a good negotiation. I think it, it came down to when I understand that Danny Danny wanted six years. They didn't come to terms. I go back and forth on this because I think that you know, part of me is like, all right, well, maybe they, they they didn't match what he wanted, but the other part of me is like. I don't know how much Danny wanted to come here. I guess that's what I like. If it was, he was using it as leverage or if he was really serious about taking over uh, this program, I think he kind of understood that if he waited, he would have a better opportunity, which is a hundred percent true. Um, I don't know, Brian, what do you think? You weren't here, you weren't covering it at the time, but you know, <laughs> I guess, is there any uh, looking back on, on the, on the grand, on the grand scheme of things about Danny Hurley? I think Danny Hurley would have done great here because he's done great at every school he's, he's done that he's, he's been to. Um, one, this school does not have the same resources for fan base or reach as UConn, brand as UConn. It's a different animal. So it's hard to uh, see if he do comparably here as he did to a place like that. I think it's hard. And two, I wonder, seems like a destination job. I think the only place he'll go after UConn is the NBA. Yeah. Would, would Rutgers be a destination job for him? If he makes it, if he if he's the one that breaks that thirty year drought to the NCAA tournament, takes Rutgers, let's say to a Sweet Sixteen, has that breakout year, is he staying at Rutgers, or is he taking the Kentucky job, for example, when that opens up and they come calling? I'm not sure he would he would treat it the same way. So um, we could play the what if game all all day. I think Rutgers fans would definitely sign up for a Daniel Hurley one breakout season before you know moving on. My, I guess my question is, could Rutgers have offered better than they did to him? Like, was that even an option at the time? I don't know. Yeah. That's yeah. what I'm saying. I, I don't yeah. think they're. Did Rutgers do the wrong thing? I don't know. They they had any other option but what they offered. So right. yeah. I don't blame Rutgers for what happened. It's so funny. If you want a better second guess, and this is this is one I thought of as I was watching the other national championship game, the good national championship game. Um, Dawn Staley. This is this is an interesting one. She coached at Temple. She is C. Vivian Stringer. I mean, acolyte. I think it's not the right word, but certainly uh, considers her one of her coaching mentors, friends. If <laughs> she left, she was at Temple. She left Temple in 2008. If Rutgers had, had no, saw what was coming with C. Vivian Stringer, and if C. Vivian Stringer was kind of recognized that, you know, all right, she had done what she wanted to do with coaching. I mean, obviously that's a long way before she retired. Pat, that's an interesting one, right? I mean, that's very because that because she could have built like she built that it. thing at a program at South Carolina with no tradition, no tradition. Yeah, and she's cut from the same cloth as C. Vivian Stringer too. Is I think what you were saying. Uh, you watch any Dawn Staley interview; she's not afraid to speak her mind, which yes. is admirable. She would have fit in great with that Jersey grit. I know she's she's a Philly girl. Like I said, tough. Uh, mm -hmm. not afraid to back down uh, I, I think that's that's a really good one and and then you think about it the same this, to bring it back to Hurley Danny Hurley same thing he's cut from that Jersey City tough guy lifestyle w coached at Rutgers coached at St. Benedict's he's as Jersey as it gets uh, so I don't, I don't know uh, it, it, it's fascinating but I love that I love that Don Staley one I think that's the first time I've heard that uh that that theory so I like it I like it because yeah, it is a total like, second guess early on the staff whatever right. yeah but Don Staley that that would have been a, certainly a game changer nobody was firing C. Vivian Stringer in, in the early uh aughts but um eh, I don't know just put him on the list of things didn't see Viv wasn't she like coming off of a national championship appearance that season or two years before that two years before that yep Yep. So if she decided she to re retire on top, she decided to walk away. I don't know. She was well, I wonder if Don Staley, when did Don Staley get that machine going in South Carolina, though? Like, could they have gotten there four years later and set from South Carolina? Just I'm out of my depth here. You got you got to call former Rutgers rank contributor James Cratch, who I'm sure is a South Carolina expert here. Um, that's out of my depth here. <laughs> I think it's out of all of our depth. Let's be honest. Uh, all right. Moving on. Next questions. Um we had the we had you, you kind of addressed it of any news of how much NIL Cliff's being offered and if Rutgers could match Cliff is not coming back to Rutgers. Uh, so I thought we I thought we had moved on there, folks. Come on, uh, we don't know how much he's being offered. Is there a list now? Is it Kentucky and St. St. John's out? I, mean, I, I haven't. I've kind of lost track. Uh, St. John's was the original 
place interested. Kentucky was interested when Cal was still there. I don't know if Mark Pope will still be interested, and I don't think Cliff particularly fits Mark Pope's five-out style anyway, so I would guess Kentucky's not on there. Uh, but I'm sure they're keeping it a little close to the vest. Uh, my understanding, I think there will be a lot of schools lined up, and I don't think a return to Rutgers is happening, guys. I, I Please, let it go. He's not coming back to Rutgers. He let it go. Let it He's go. Not- it's, it's, uh, it's he broke up with you guys. It's over. He loved you, but he broke up. The divorce is done. He is not coming back. Um, because uh, I don't Aaron, think Rutgers has Rutgers, Rutgers does not have the NIL money to spend on Cliff O'Mori based on what he's getting offered in the open market. It just let it go. A heady optimistic fan asked about Aaron Bradshaw. He's going to Ohio State now, so we don't have to worry about that. Pat, look, you're going to say something. I mean, to interrupt you. I was just going to ask because you wrote a great piece over the summer with Cliff sit down and talking about how he can't earn NIL legally in the United States. It has to be done under the table, off the books, out on a boat, whatever. Um, can you clear the air there on that? Because it seems yeah. like this is totally contradictory. Yeah, I mean, it's going to it's going to be something like that. And, and uh, they've certainly gotten around it in, in a million different ways. He's going to have to leave either the team's going to have to leave the country for one of these trips like he did with Rutgers and they went to, you know, filming commercials for wing joints um, <laughs> off the coast of Senegal or, uh, or he's got to do it himself, which is also possible. I mean, you know, he's got all summer to travel to uh, wherever he wants to go. Could, could Korean could be home. He's not been to Nigeria. I don't think since he's left. Um, so there's a lot of different possibilities there where he could take care of that. You know, what, what the story I did at the time and talking to experts was that there's risk involved in that because, um, you know, this these are uh, immigration laws. This is not NCAA laws that he might be violating. Uh, you got to be really careful because they don't like ask questions, or there's no like, you know, hearing of a bunch of educators in, in Indianapolis who can look at this. No, this is you know, this is the government who can say, no, we're taking your freaking visa. I wonder though now that he's graduated if it's different. There's like there's so many different wrinkles to what these rules are. But Basically, yeah, you're absolutely right. That the government wants a piece of that money, right? Yeah, that's true. Yes, he's right, going to pay. He's going to pay 40% of the tax. Deal. Like when it comes to professional sports, people signing free agency deals and, and things like yeah. that, like taxes play a big part of it. And it, it's that's a, a really unspoken thing in NIL. Like, it's true. He's over that point. Yes. Another reason why we don't get the numbers <laughs> yeah, right. for, for the record. The accountants do not want us to know how much these players are making. Uh, another, thing, right. another, thing on, another thing on Cliff. Uh, for example, St. John's. They are going to play a regular season game, I believe, in the Bahamas or some foreign country. So that's an easy solution if he goes to St. John's. Uh, but I believe there's the idea of like passive income versus active income. Like if he gets a billboard somewhere else outside of the United States, he can get the money. But if he, you know, shoots a commercial or or does an appearance, he can't. Yeah, I'm not that's exactly absolutely sure right. Yeah. Here's here's the, here's the reality: these teams will find out how to do it. They always find a workaround. There are probably a million workarounds. So don't – this is kind of like uh, how people talk about scholarship math around Greg Schiano. There's only 85 scholarships, but he always figures, figures out a way how to work it out. Yeah. These colleges always find a way to work out the NIL. Um, and look, if in five years these things kind of you know, end up getting people in some legal trouble, that doesn't matter because the banner is going to be hanging in the gym anyway. So yep. I think that's kind of the approach. Even Rutgers is pushing the envelope now with doing a video. See that? Athletic director did a did a video asking people to donate to yes. really pushing the envelope there. Really uh, edgy stuff. Edgy stuff. If this was summer edgy. of twenty twenty one, we'd be on the cutting edge. <laughs> edgy stuff. I'm gonna leave that there. What else do we got question wise? What oh, this is for you, Pat. What an update on the latest with Mason Gibson decommitting from Penn State and we're to be going to Rutgers. Huge get for Goody happening. Yeah, so this is I, I tweeted this. This is the most fascinating recruitment to ever play out on social media and under my eyes like this kid was out retweeting goody before he even committed or decommitted from penn state so there's this big speculation oh he's gonna he's gonna come to Rutgers now uh and then then he does decommit from penn state and it's like oh all signs point to Rutgers. he's coming on a visit here i i expect that one to be a done deal but I, my question is how did he get out of the nil at penn state because he signed there and my I don't know this for sure, but my intuition is that he probably was there. There were only nine point nine scholarships in wrestling, and there are ten starting spots. So that's a whole nother yeah, <laughs> right. Out of that. He's probably not going to be a scholarship kid at Penn State. He's very talented. Could be a, a, he's a big time recruit, but he probably wasn't even 
with think about all the guys Penn State has in yeah. that room. For him to get a scholarship there, it's probably unlikely. It's probably just a way better scenario for him at Rutgers. And, and that's what it came down to. This kid uh, was just looking for the best scenario for himself. And, and I think that should be coming out soon that he'll be uh, in the Rutgers wrestling room. So while we're on wrestling, Nick Suriano at in at his own school in Happy Valley trying to qualify for the Olympics. I saw he's the sixth seed. You yeah. told me he was going to we you told me we were going to have some handsome Tuesdays in Paris. And now I'm, <laughs> now I'm less certain by this. Like, I, I was yeah. a little surprised. The, the whole Olympic trial thing is so the, there are challenge matches when you get to the semifinals. It's very, very convoluted. And, and the whole freestyle wrestling is kind of out of my purview. <laughs> like, I, I don't really. Here's one thing that Nick Sirion would tell you point blank. Seeds don't matter. He's going to go out and he's going to win it. So it is okay. a good weight, but I, I, I wouldn't count him out. He's, he's really well. The social media stuff is on point. And I think you're going to have. You know, uh, a Politi, Soriano, at the Louvre, with the Mona Lisa in the background. <laughs> my next <laughs> awkward interview, my second awkward interview with him will be in, in front of the Eiffel Tower. It would just be, I just get very excited about that. So going to make and that happen. While you're on the topic of the Paris Olympics, uh, Rutgers will have a wrestler at the Par Paris Olympics, but he's wrestling for Puerto Rico, Sebastian Rivera will be a great story and, and Rutgers fans should follow him in, in Paris because he's, he's going to be in the mix too. So he's already qualified. He's definitely going. So you got at least one Rutgers story out of, uh, out of your travel to Paris. Got good else. I don't make the mistake as I did my favorite Rutgers moment with, with, with Jordan Burroughs when he was in the Olympics and he lost, like it was a big upset and I was watching it and I'm like, well, he's down after two periods. He'll get him after the, the he'll get him in the third period. And then the guy next to me said, well, there is no third period. It's over, you dumbass. Like, oh, okay. It was great. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. I'll get him in the third period. I don't know why I thought. I don't know why I thought there was a third period. College, scholastic, folk style wrestling. Completely different. Don't know. All right. What else we got here? Uh, people want to know about baseball. Any chance of baseball or lacrosse making an NCAA tournament? Men's lax seems cooked. They Coach. lost to Maryland this weekend, which is not a surprise. Maryland's number five in the country, uh, but they're now seven and five overall, one and three okay. in the Big Ten. They're probably going to lose uh, to Penn State on senior night this Friday. Uh, otherwise, it would be an upset. It would be a pretty big upset. Uh, I think lacrosse is having a down year. Uh, baseball, uh, a big series win this weekend against Nebraska, had an extra innings win on Friday night uh, and won the series on Sunday. Uh, they're three and six in the Big Ten, so not a great start. Uh, but they have a winning record overall, and I think if there's there's still a lot of you know the league schedule left, I think they can put themselves in a good spot entering the Big Ten tournament, and they can compete for a Big Ten tournament title. Um, so I, I don't know if they have a good chance of making the tournament, but I think it's certainly a possibility. Um, and women's lacrosse, uh, they are currently six and eight and zero and five in conference play. So I will say no, they are probably also cooked. Cooked. Softball is having a decent season. They are eight and six in conference. 26 and 18 overall. Um, but I'm not going to pretend like I know the strength of the Big Ten in the sport. So will they make the tournament? I have, I, can't, I have no idea, to be completely honest. But uh, their record looks good. While you're, talking the... softball, while you're talking softball, you got to give a shout out to Morgan Smith. He's in, listen to these stats. Uh, she's batting 449, 63 RBI, and 19 homers. It's like unbelievable. I think that set set the program obviously single season record. She's on fire, and that's a big shout out there. Transfer from LSU. Uh, what else we got? Anything? Really quick. Uh, Caleb McConnell last night uh, won the G League championship with the Oklahoma City Blue. Uh, he is a league champion in his first year as a professional. Uh, so always good to see uh, Noah Rucker's guy do well. I caught up with him when I went to watch him play live in his regular season finale. In Delaware, uh, said he was really enjoying his first year with the organization. And clearly, he's in a great spot because they're the G League champions. They're the number one seed in the West. And they're doing it mostly with homegrown guys that they've drafted well. Uh, so clearly, he's in a really, really good organization. So if this is – he's obviously trying to make it to the NBA. That's his goal. This is a chance for him to, you know, develop a little. And um, whether he'll make it or not, I don't know. But so far, his professional career is off to a good start. I'll, I'll just have one guy. thing. One thing coming up: NFL draft. It's going to be 
big thing coming up. Max Melton is is soaring up draft charts and had a great senior bowl combine Rutgers pro day tested really well. Uh, Mel Kuyper has him, uh, I think second round he's, wow. he's, he's really uh, shooting up the board, which is uh, not surprising. If you saw how he played, especially in the second half of last season, he was incredible. Uh, he had a great game against Marvin Harrison jr. When they played Ohio state, like I said, the scouts are just really impressed with his ability to play inside out and 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 run and, and his speed is really good so uh, i think that's something to look out for in the nfl draft a potential second rounder uh, pretty good and who are the giants gonna take <laughs> i hope a receiver uh, jj <laughs> mccarthy what's that column gonna say oh man <laughs> <laughs> jj mccarthy giants. played really well against the Rutgers, i thought but he can't remember anything he did against Rutgers. <laughs> He was he was out of the pocket extending plays nonstop against Rutgers. He, okay. he, I know Michigan didn't need JJ McCarthy to be the best player on the field, but against Rutgers, I thought he was he was the best player. But I was also watching from the stands, so that's I didn't get a traditional view. Right. <laughs> the, the best quarterback. This is going to be a good one. The, the in the draft, the quarterback who played best against Rutgers is Michael Penix. Yeah, am I right about that? Good analysis. Well, that was five, five years ago. <laughs> right. He's he's not 21 anymore. We know yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. That's just true. Yeah. Well, so two things. One, Pat, you're selling himself short because as we all know, the best analysts are always sitting in the stands. Those guys know what they're talking about more than anybody yeah. else. Yes. So yeah. Don't sell yourself yeah. short. Second of all, J.J. McCarthy. Uh, I don't know any of his stats off the top of my head. I know these things. He won a national championship undefeated. You know what that tells me? He's a winner. No oh boy. Uh, Daniel Thanks, Jones Jim. did not win a single national championship. Not one. J.J. McCarthy has won one. He is a winner. How many times has Michigan won a national championship in the past 25 years? Once, yeah. Who was the quarterback for that team? Okay. That's great. Okay. okay. I will say go. Michael Penix played one of the best college football games I ever saw was when Indiana beat Penn State. That was, like, unbelievable. Absolutely. Was, Again, that was five years ago. Legendary, though. <laughs> I mean, Rutgers fans should be happy that Michael Penix isn't going to be on Washington when they play him this year. Let's just can we leave it at that. And JJ yes, <laughs> JJ McCarthy. All those quarterbacks. <laughs> all those quarterbacks will be someplace else. Was it Michael Penix and Gio Rochino's recruiting class or something like that? Chris Laviano, those contemporaries. <laughs> you didn't. You had a chance to say Hayden hey, Reddick's name, and you didn't do it. Very disappointing. <laughs> Sorry, that's your guy. Yeah. All right. Let's end it there, fellas. Get back to practice. You've got another four minutes to watch, I'm sure, at the end of this. Do your interviews. We'll be back. I don't know about next week, maybe the week after. We'll see to talk about uh, what's going on. Thanks for listening. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Wait, what? 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 The host is the number one column no, in stop. the country. Good grief. Of course, he doesn't bring it up, so we got to do it. Oh, man. Yeah, because it. Of- before yeah. we sign up, you may have saw that Steve Politi was named the number one columnist in the country by the PSE. Uh, mm. Huge honor. Second time in his career. I think the numbers speak for themselves there. Just want to say congrats, Steve. You deserve it. Well, if there's one thing that the general public cares about, it's journalism awards. That's what I've <laughs> discovered. Yeah. When you're when they're sitting there reading my five observations from the uh, Virginia Tech game. <laughs> this, this guy won an award? <laughs> He's terrible. You're like the Michael Penix of this staff, right? You'll be around <laughs> another 30 years. Can't get rid of you. Uh, uh, thanks, fellas. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Okay, now you can uh, sign up. Now I can sign up. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Later. Thank you for listening to the Rutgers Rant. To participate in the conversation and receive live updates about the Scarlet Knights directly to your phone, sign up at nj.com slash insider.